Quentin Tarantino rewrites the history of Nazi Germany in Inglorious Bastards, the latest stage of a career that's put a stick of dynamite under filmmaking. His crime films, Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown and Kill Bill have made an art of violence paired with precise, often absurd dialogue. He's championed non-linear storytelling, paid homage to many other genres along the way, and as one of Hollywood's most inventive directors, been honored at the BAFTAs and the Oscars. This is his life in pictures. Thanks, everybody. Well, welcome to BAFTA. Good to be here again. Good. Now, obviously, life and pictures, we're just going to go right the way through the life. So, born in Tennessee, but yes. then moved with your mother to California. Mm -hmm. and age two. <laughs> age two. Um, did you get most of your early film watching through television or in theatres? It was a pretty good mix. I mean, I'm sure I saw uh, tons of stuff on television, but um, my mom was really, really young, and uh, my, uh, my parents were really young, so you know, movies were about the only thing that they could afford to do. And they, even before they could afford to take a babysitter, hire a babysitter, it was either cheaper to just take me. <laughs> so, uh, and, I, and uh, as opposed to uh, in England, uh, you're not restricted to stuff. You, have, you can go see movies, like R-rated movies and uh, restricted films, if your parents take you to see them. And they never um, uh, um, qualified what I could see. You know, they just figured there was nothing in the movie that would ever bother me. So what, at a very, very young age, I was like seeing The Wild Bunch and Deliverance and all these, uh, all these things. And uh, so I was just always seeing adult, and, and, uh, adult kind of entertainment. But I also watched all kinds of classic movies on television. And did you think very early on that you actually would quite like to do it yourself? As a child, if you watch movies and you, and you like them and you want to be a part of them, then you think about the acting because that's all you really know about is the actors. So you see those are the people that you see. So they're the ones doing what you want to do. If you want to be involved in movies, then you, naturally you want to be an actor. And um, I even remember um, at a very, very young age, my mom like telling her friends when they'd be over at the house, oh, Quinn is going to be a director one of these days. And they go, no, I don't want to be a director. I want to be, a, I didn't even know what a director was. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, want to be a, I want to be an actor. And, um, but then pretty quickly as a little kid, uh, even, even and still as the young, I started knowing who a, I started knowing who everybody was. I would go see a movie, and I, I was horrible in school and couldn't do anything in school. But I'd go see a movie, and I knew every actor in it. I knew the name of the director. I knew the name of the producer and the writer. And, and uh, I just started getting an encyclopedic knowledge about that stuff. So you had that knowledge, but you decided you didn't want to do too much school after about sixteen. Or yeah, so, yeah. Oh so. well, no, I quit. I definitely quit school. I, school was horrible for me. It was. The worst institution ever imposed on me. <laughs> it was uh, yeah, to me, school was prison. I hated school. So you jumped out of prison, and you did a number of jobs, including famously working in a porn cinema. Yes, I did. Yeah, that was actually the first real job job I ever got. At, at, at age 16, I got a, a, a job as a, a usher at the Pussycat Theater, <laughs> which was a, a porno cinema. I mean, full-on triple X porn. <laughs> But in, in some ways, the, the really important job after that was a little bit later when you went to video archives. Terrific, yes. The video true. store. Yeah, they had a fantastic collection of movies. So I had for five years the greatest collection of movies you could ever have literally at my disposal to watch all the time. And at the same time, you were also developing your own screenplay yeah, and yeah. making your own film over quite a long period, about four or five years. Is that yeah, right? yeah. I started shooting a, a short film. I actually was... Uh, by a, a filmmaker that I had met along the way named Fred Olin Ray, let me borrow a 16 millimeter camera. And I started making a short film. And then I said, after shooting that for a little while, I go, wait a minute. Um, let's make a feature. Let's just turn, expand it into a feature. So, we, you know, so that started this process of a movie called My Best Friend's Birthday. And, um, and I proceeded to work on that movie for about three years basically financing it completely myself from a minimum wage job. So we would shoot, and then I'd, and that would be it, and I'd run out of money, I'd r raise a couple more, more hundred dollars, and we'd do it again. Um, that drug on for about like three years. And were you happy with it? Well, I started putting it together and um, kind of realized I didn't have what I thought I had. And so what happened was with this, I was, oh my God, this was just all for nothing. And I'm kind of going to be a laughing stock. I got nothing to show for all this work. However, 
The stuff I did in the first, say, year and a half or two years, well, that was the really student filmy amateur stuff. But the stuff I had done in the last year of shooting, that wasn't bad. It was, it was pretty good. There was a genuine, definite progression. And so I looked at it as like, well, OK, look, that was my film school. I didn't know how to make a movie before I did this. And now I did this. And now I, I do know how to make a movie. And it was my film school. And it was a pretty goddamn cheap film school. And to this day, I actually think that other than the film history aspect, of, of, of film schools, that rather than go to film school, just get a camera and try to start making a movie. Now, what you also learned by the time you got to Reservoir Dogs was that actually it was very useful also to have people who could help you. I mean, Monty Hillman, for example. Yeah, Monty Hillman helped me out a lot. Director of Tulane Blacktop. Yeah. Yeah, he helped, didn't he? And then you got Harvey Keitel interested yeah. in the script. Now, how did exactly. that happen? We had Monty Hillman, and then we had a, 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 my producer on the film, Lawrence Bender, who did ba Bastards as well. and. Um, and he goes, okay, Quentin, as far as Mr. White's concerned, who would be your dream, dream actor to play the role? And Harvey Cattell was like my favorite actor. So I was like, Harvey Cattell, that totally would be my dream. Well, it just so happened that Lawrence didn't know Harvey, but Lawrence was going to an acting class, and his teacher's wife <laughs> was uh, a student at the actor studio. So it was a situation where we send it to his teacher. His teacher read it and liked it, passed it on to his wife. His wife read it and liked it, <laughs> and then passed it on to Harvey. And she actually even said to Harvey, she said, look, I, don't, I feel weird doing this, but I really think this is a really special piece of material, and I think I owe it to you to, to pass it on to you. And then the next thing we knew, Harvey called us up on the phone. He loved it. Not only did he want to do it, he wanted to help us get it made. He goes, I've never done this before, but I'd like to just be one of the producers on the film. And it was, that was, it was like a dream come true. It was, just, it was just wonderful. But do you see how precarious all that was? As bad luck as I had seemed like I had had and everything leading up to this moment was as good as my luck was on Reservoir Dogs. Well, this seems like a good moment to see a bit of Reservoir Dogs, sure. which um, I'm sure you won't need reminding is about a heist gone awry. But we're actually <laughs> going to look at an earlier bit, which is uh, when the crew are all variously assigned their names. With the exception of Eddie and myself, we already know, we're going to be using aliases on this job. Under no circumstances, do I want any one of you to relate to each other by your Christian names? And I don't want any talk about yourself personally. That includes where you've been, your wife's name, where you might have done time, or a bank maybe you arrived in, say, Petersburg. All I want you guys to talk about, if you have to, is what you're going to do. That should do it. Hear your names. Mr. Brown, Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange, and Mr. Pink. Why am I Mr. Pink? Because you're a f all right? <laughs> Why can't we pick our own colors? No way, no way. Try it once, it doesn't work. You get four guys all fighting over who's going to be Mr. Black. But they don't know each other, so nobody wants to back down. No way. I pick. You're Mr. Pink. Be thankful you're not Mr. Yellow. Now, in the, of course, what happens quite soon after this is does very well, Reservoir Dogs, everybody loves Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Um, then Natural Born Killers, mm -hmm. your next script, yeah. um, is made by Oliver Stone. Right. But by the time it's made, you are credited with story rather than script. Yeah. So what did you think of the finished? Well, I've never thing? seen the finished movie, Nat mm -hmm. Natural Born Killers. See, I would have actually got first credit position on Natural Born Killers if I had allowed it. But I was so pissed off that they rewrote my work. I believe in integrity, and I did not want my, I didn't care about the, the residuals or any of that stuff. God forbid anyone thought that that was my screenplay. And you feel you made that clear. That, that was absolutely Well, and then not only that, oh, I attacked Oliver Stone in the press. How dare you rewrite my shit? Well, that's standard Hollywood practice. F Hollywood practice. You don't do that to me. You know? Um, and uh, but the whole point. You know, we've actually made it up since then, but the whole point, though... <laughs> that must have been a conversation. <laughs> no, it, it went a long time. It went for a long time, all right? We got drunk together, and it was fine, all right? Um, but, uh, you know, but the point, I wanted all of Hollywood to know, do not buy Quentin's script unless you're going to do it. <laughs> if you bring another writer, I'm going to attack you. <laughs> 
So you went to, to write Pulp Fiction, you went to Amsterdam? Yeah, I started some, there, yeah. Uh -huh. So what kind of research were you doing in Amsterdam? Well, it wasn't so much doing... <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't so much I was doing research. I was, uh, <laughs> I had never been anywhere before. I was just, you know, I, I just, it's hard to describe how broke I was through all of my 20s. I got paid $50,000 for Reservoir Dogs. So I said, well, I'm finally gonna, I'm gonna go to Europe. I've always wanted to go to Europe and now I'm gonna go, but I'm gonna go for a while. And so I actually ended up getting a really cool little uh, place to stay in Amsterdam. I go, well, you know what, let me see what it's like living in another, in an, another country. And so that's where I just started writing. So they had no connection about Amsterdam and writing. It was just a place to live while I was writing and have this really wonderful experience. But everything that's ever going on with me at whatever I'm writing will, fit, will find its way into the material. So since I was living in Amsterdam and having this brand new eye-opening experience of what it's like in Europe, I made it that that was, that was happening to Vincent at the exact same time. You know, that he had just come back from Amsterdam and they're asking him all these stupid questions about it and he's explaining it to them. Well, that seems like a very good point. I wish to see a clip from the film. Cool. And uh, the hitmen, Vincent and Jules, uh, John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson. When we're going to see them, uh, now they are on their way to one of their uh, deadly work appointments. Um, but they're discussing on the way consumers' habits in the Netherlands. Okay, so tell me again about the hash bar. Okay, what you want to know? Yeah, it's just legal there, right? Yeah, it's legal, but ain't 100% legal. I mean, you just can't walk into a restaurant, roll the joint, and start puffing away. I mean, they want you to smoke in your home or certain designated places. And those are hash bars. Yeah, it breaks down like this, okay. It's, it's legal to buy it, it's legal to own it. And if you're the proprietor of a hash bar, it's legal to sell it. It's legal to carry it, but, but, but that doesn't matter, because get a load of this, all right? If you get stopped by a cop in Amsterdam, it's illegal for them to search you. I mean, that's the right that cops in Amsterdam don't have. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm going. That's all it is to it. I'm <laughs> No, baby, you dig it the most. Now, John Travolta, who obviously we saw there, yeah. why did you decide to pick him up at that stage for Pulp Fiction? You'd been presumably in Admira when you yeah, came. Yeah. Did you see Saturday Night, well, Saturday Night Fever? I suppose you would have been yeah. a teenager. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I was always thought he was a really terrific actor. And um, I always felt bad that uh, he'd kind of like fallen on hard times or kind of fallen by the wayside. And I remember... Um, they did a piece about him in the Los Angeles Times about, boy, whatever happened to John Travolta? And the whole thing kind of talking about his career and where he was and kind of what's happened to him now. But they interviewed Pauline Kael and they asked her, um, do you think John can ever come back? And she goes, he has to. Movies need him. <laughs> and I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And, uh, and I agreed with her. But I respected her so much that with, I felt it, and when she felt it, then I felt I had all I needed to go to any court in the land and fight for him. And, um, and literally, you know, uh, I wanted to you know, put him in the film, and, and uh, Harvey Weinstein didn't want him. No one would have wanted him. And I go, well, look, Harvey, here's the thing. I think he's a terrific actor, and I think you need to go and look at Blowout again, because I think that is a magnificent performance. And if you watch him in Blowout and you don't think he gives a terrific performance, then you should not make this movie, because we obviously do not see the same way about taste. <laughs> our, our version of good work and bad work is not the same, and, and I need to make a movie with somebody else. And I go, well, okay, I guess he's serious. <laughs> and so Harvey backed down, and I was able to cast John. <laughs> Now, around this time, you also uh, you have this company, Rolling Thunder, mm -hmm. starts up around then, yeah, yeah. which is to do with marketing and distribution. Now. Of older films. And the other thing was, um, you know, I was going to film festivals a lot. And when I went to film festivals, I just didn't do the stupid press. I went and saw movies. So I was seeing all these movies. And I got tired of recommending these movies to the Miramax, you know, uh, 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 the, their acquisition department. I got really annoyed of uh, recommending them to the acquisition department and them ignoring me. And, oh, it's not right, it's not right, blah, blah, blah. So I went to Harvey and go, why don't you just set aside a little fun and let, give me the chance to buy films. I mean, I'm not, and, and, and my point in coming on it was, um, you're not gonna get paid a lot from me, but your film's gonna get released. You know, if, if anyone else will buy the rights to your film, then they should. <laughs> sell it to them. But if no one will buy the rights to your film and I like it, well then let's make a deal. You know, it is the reality that, um, you know, there's a lot of directors and they can be renowned and they can play at festivals, but until they finally get an American commercial theatrical release, they're not like officially on the map. 
it's not just playing at a film festival. It's actually getting a full theatrical release. And if it's actually being picked up and being shown in America, then they're saying it's one of 50. It's one of 80. It's not just a good movie. It actually deserves a screen and deserves to have a chance for people paying to see it. So your next film as director was actually an adaptation of Elmore Leonard, yeah. Jackie Brown. Now, had you read Leonard a lot? When oh, yeah, no, I was a big fan of Elmore Leonard, and he was probably the biggest influence on my writing because, um, you know, the conversations that would happen in his books were the conversations that me and my friends would have and that the kind of conversations that I thought uh, 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 could be in movie dialogue that I'd never heard before. And when I read his stuff, it see, this, this can work. He was like my, he gave me the permission to go further with what I wanted to do. So Rum Punch became Jackie, Jackie Brown, Brown, and Jackie Brown was played by Pam Greer, yeah. who had been Foxy Brown in yes, 1974, exactly. yeah. and she'd been one of those really early female action stars. Yeah, exactly. in the book, the character was white, and her name was Jackie Birch. Uh, the whole idea was that she was a, a more mature lady who was uh, still very beautiful, and ends up that she can kind of handle anything. She just has a poker face that she can lie and not, not crumble, where everyone else would crumble in a, in a tight situation. That's where she, where she shines, actually, and she gets calmer. And um, I go, hmm, well, that sounds like Pam Greer to me. <laughs> well, here we're going to see uh, an excerpt where Pam Greer, who is playing Jackie Brown, the flight attendant, with a bit of a sideline, mm -hmm. doesn't she have, where she, and she's discussing here with the, the gun dealer, Odell Robbie, played by Samuel L. Jackson, how to <laughs> smuggle in half a million dollars into the United States. Where are you planning on pulling this up? The Delamo Mall, the food court. And I suppose you see a piece of this for yourself. It's my plan. We're in this together. Yeah, but it's my money, and I don't need no partners. Ain't your partner. I'm your manager. And I'm managing to get your money out of Mexico into America in your hands, and I'm managing to do it all under the nose of the cops. So, therefore, I'm your manager, and a manager gets 15%. No, manager gets 10%. <laughs> no, that's an agent. A I'm manager gets... 10. No, no. A manager gets... 15%, agent gets 10, I'm getting 15%, all, all right? All I'm gonna give you is 10. And the same deal as before. I can do that. One of the things about Jackie Brown was that actually, although the narrative was in some ways more linear than mm -hmm. your previous stuff, yeah. you tell mm -hmm. one's incident from several different Perspectives. Yeah, yeah. I just thought that uh, uh, that would be the way to, to tell the story, was to just follow one person all the way through and then go back again and follow another person all the way through and then go back again and follow the other person all the way through. It's just exactly the way it, it hit me as I was reading it uh, to do it. And you gave them all different, all the characters had different soundtracks as well, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. which converge at one point. Well, they all, yeah, they have the, the, yeah, they, yeah, they have their different soundtracks and also every character kind of had their own drink. <laughs> that they drank in that, all right. Uh, uh, Ordell always drunk screwdrivers, orange juice and uh, vodka. Uh, uh, Jackie Brown always drunk white wine. Uh, and uh, Louis and Melanie smoke pot. <laughs> so guess. Now, next then we get to uh, the fourth film by Quentin Tarantino, mm -hmm. as it says in the yeah. title of it, which is Kill Bill Volumes 1 and 2. Now, you and Uma Thurman cooked this up between you, didn't you, the idea, mm -hmm. when you were making Pulp Fiction? Yeah. The idea was doing a revenge movie. The idea was doing a kind of a, a, a 70s style. Uh, this is before it became a martial arts thing. That happened later. Uh, but at the, earlier on, it was like a, a badass chick revenge movie with the, Uma Thurman gets like screwed up by this guy named Bill, and she's going to kill all of his lieutenants and then gets Bill at the end. And so uh, me and Uma were in the throes of a very great artistic love affair, all right? It's like, oh, she's my actress. Oh, he's my director. And uh, it was <laughs> very lovely. And so I came up with that. I, uh, I, I told her about the idea. And then, you know, uh, on the set, or we'd go out for drinks afterwards, and we'd talk a little bit more about it, and she'd get a little more excited. And then she started adding a couple of things. And one of the things that she added was, uh, she goes, um, Quentin, you said that. So it starts off with, with uh, uh, Bill shooting her, right? Because I always had that idea of, you know, uh, shot in the head at the very beginning. She's lying on the floor, and then she goes, what if the camera, like, moves back from her close-up of her face, and she's been shot in the head, and the camera moves back from her face, and you see she's in a bridal gown. And that was the day the bride was born. 
And probably the bride is, is possibly the cinema heroine who suffers more than almost any other heroine we can think of on mm -hmm. screen. She just goes through more and more. It's almost like a religious experience. Yeah, no, no. She goes, yeah, she goes through hell. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, maybe Jesus and the Passion of Christ goes a little worse than her, but, but only a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's see the moment when she finally, this is obviously from Kill Bill 2, when she finally catches up with Bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the whole kind of idea of uh, confrontation and cold revenge. And Bill is played by another actor whose career mm -hmm. uh, was hibernating, shall we say, yes, exactly, and, yeah. until you came along, by David Carradine. Could you do what you did? Of course you could. But I never thought you would or could do that to me. I'm really sorry, kiddo, but you thought wrong. You and I have unfinished business. Baby, you ain't kidding. <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, action and violence in cinema. I always said that it was almost as if it was one of the reasons Thomas Edison invented the camera, was to film violence, all right, because it's so good. Um, and, uh, uh, and the genres that I'm attracted to tend to be genres that deal freely in that kind of stuff. And that has to be done well, because if you don't do it well, then it actually has no effect. What I'm about is playing the audience. Like, uh, uh, I, I feel like, I'm the orchestra conductor, and the audience's reaction are my orchestra. And you're, you're, the sounds you make are my instruments, and your feelings are my instruments. And so it's like, I want to, um, so it's like, laugh, laugh, laugh. Stop laughing. <laughs> Stop laughing. OK, now be horrified. Be horrified. This is horrible. This is horrible. This is horrible, horrible, horrible. <laughs> laugh. And that's what I want to do. That's what, I, that's what I get off doing. And to me, when, when, I, when someone does that to me, I've had a good time at the movies. But by getting that reaction, okay, I may be being far too heavy about this here, but is there a sense in which some of your violence, I find, when I, watch, I find really difficult to watch. I mean, you see mm -hmm. a lot of violence in cinema, but even just going back to Reservoir Dogs, you know, man bleeding in the back of a cab, yeah, yeah. or whatever it is, really unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, there are bits in Inglorious Bastards, really unsettling. Mm -hmm. Is that because you never want people to forget the capacity, if you like, for humans to harm one another? No, I think you are getting too heavy with it, as far as I'm concerned. You know? uh, I thought maybe I was. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't have concerns or thoughts like that. You know, uh, 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 if a guy's guy shot in the, in the stomach and he's bleeding like a stuck pig, I want to see him bleeding like a stuck pig. That is, the, that is now the situation they're dealing with. All right, it's not, he's like, ooh, ow, he's got a stomach ache and a little round hole right here. No, he's going to have like, you know, a pint or two of groo, you know, uh, you know, building up. You know, uh, you know, I want to see that. That is now a thing that they have to deal with. Now, there's a question about any of your films where you're making lots of references to earlier genres. Mm -hmm. to, if people haven't seen them, does it matter if they don't get the references? No, not at all. Because I'm just known as such a film aficionado, there is this aspect that uh, everybody who writes about cinema or thinks about it just kind of sees me coming, basically. So everyone feels like they want to match wits with me and figure out that, you know, where did this come from? Where did that come from? And most of the illusions that people come up with, uh, I wasn't thinking about. I mean, I might have <laughs> seen it, but I wasn't thinking about it. And I think they're kind of pushing the, 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 the point to say that I, uh, I, that I was from this or from that. Um, having said that, though, you know, there is a lot of things like that. But, you know, the way, you know, the way it works is, uh, you know, if you understand the context from which I'm coming from and, and the genres that I'm, that I'm evoking and the, and the moods and the feelings of them, well, then that's great. Now you can appreciate it for, in that way, and that's, all, and that's all good. And if you haven't, then it's all brand new to you. And, uh, and you can look at it in a completely different way. And now it's got to work in a whole different way for you because you, 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 know, you don't understand the genre. I have to take you there myself. And I guess Inglourious Bastards is a really good example of that because yeah. you are working from an idea of, of 
a couple of films, particularly from the 70s, but obviously a whole lot of Second World War films mm -hmm. that maybe you saw on television that a whole generation will never have seen. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I like jumping off from the idea of like, you take a big genre, like say a Westerns, or you take a genre like war films, and that's one, that's a huge genre, because, and, and it's not just Westerns, or not just war films, there's a b bunch of subgenres inside of those, and that's what I like the most, are subgenres. And then bouncing a bunch of those off of each other. And, and the thing is, I never want to play them I'm never playing them straight. I always want to transcend them. I just want to use them as a jumping off point to do something else. But I, want them, I don't want them to be an art, you know, some pretentious artistic art film meditation on the genre. I want to go and do it my own way. And so I want to give you the same pleasures, but kind of go to a different drummer. Hence, you know, Reservoir Dogs is, um, is a heist film where you never see the heist. Um, um, in Glorious Bastards, the genre I was starting off working with was a bunch of guys on a mission movie. And it kind of is that, but it's beyond that. There's other things involved. But then you have this extraordinary actor in the center of it who plays the Nazi, yeah. uh, the main Nazi figure, Christoph Waltz. Mm -hmm. Now, where did you find him? When I wrote that script, I was so proud of the character on the page that I, I didn't want to do the movie unless he could be as good on the screen as he was on the page. I couldn't have any compromise as far as I was concerned. And so I read all these different uh, uh, German actors for the role. There was a lot of them who really wanted the part. But they couldn't pull off my dialogue in English. And it wasn't a situation of, of them not being fluent. They could be fluent. We, we could have a conversation for the next six hours, and they would be able to speak English just fine. But English really wasn't the language for them to read poetry in. It wasn't the language for them to sing in. They couldn't get the right comedy rhythms that, that, that happened in there. And I was literally starting to think that maybe I wrote a part that was unplayable. And there was one morning, I, I, I called the, the producers into my hotel room. I said, guys, I'm not trying to freak everybody out, but uh, uh, I don't know if we're going to find Londa. I don't know if we're going to find the perfect Londa anyway. And unless we find the perfect Londa, I'd rather not make this movie. We had had a deal pending where Universal was going to come in on the movie. But in the meantime, you know, I figured the movie's going to get made, so I'm financing everything myself. And so if I'm going to pull the plug, this would be the week to pull the plug. Because on Friday, I think it was on Friday, Universal, uh, or Monday, Universal would, would be bankrolling us. So I had to pull the plug before they started bankrolling us. So that would be this week. And I really have to give the producers uh, credit. They didn't freak out. They were just, they looked at it very, they, they got it. They got it and they go, okay, well then, you know what? This week is Londa, 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 Londa. If we, if we go down, we'll know for sure that you're right. There is not a guy to play this goddamn role. And that day, Christoph walked in the room, waltzed in the room, <laughs> and um, I didn't know who he was. He's mostly known in, uh, in Germany for doing t uh, TV. And literally, it was a thing, uh, me and Lawrence were in the room, and he came in and, and started, his, started his read, and just like three minutes into an almost 20 minute scene, once he started doing the English, and started just, just getting the rhythms, and getting the things, me and Lawrence looked at each other, and we knew we were making the movie. He literally gave me my movie back. Now we should see an example of, of him as Landa, um, the, the man who threatens all the way through to be the nemesis of the, yeah. of the Nazi scalp hunks as the, the bastards. And here he's negotiating his way out of a position um, as the Allies are closing in. Uh, and he's talking to the bemused leader of the bastards, who of course is Brad Pitt, um, and also another of their number, uh, played by B.J. Novak. Gentlemen, I have no intention of killing Hitler and killing Goebbels and killing Goering and killing Bormann, not to mention winning the war single-handedly for the Allies, only later to find myself standing before a Jewish tribunal. If you want to win the war tonight, we have to make a deal. What kind of deal? The kind you wouldn't have the authority to make. However, I'm sure this mission of yours has a commanding officer, a general. Mm, I'm betting for OSS would be my guess. Ooh, that's a bingo. <laughs> Is that the way you say it? That's a bingo? You just say bingo. Bingo, how fun. 
There's quite a lot of, obviously, rewriting of history, but I guess every war film rewrites history, doesn't it? Yeah, no, that, well, that's how I looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> you just went that bit further. Yeah, I just decided to just really go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Quentin Tarantino, for your life and pictures, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, it was lovely. Thank you, thank you everybody.